the key factors here could be volume of miscommunication, tone, message, frequency, but also the size of the audience they're addressing, which is the follower count. And finally, there's Twitter paid media. Not yet. Uh, this is where the advertisers invest in Twitter ads in order to reach their target audiences below, beyond their follower base. So we wanted to capture the entire Twitter universe and understand the differentiated impact of uh, Twitter paid, owned, and earned. But we knew that if we only look at the relationship between Twitter and sales, we're going to get the wrong picture. We need context. We needed to understand how and what other media channels contribute to sales. Therefore, we needed to capture all offline and online media as well. But we know that it's not only about media. There are also other factors, other marketing factors such as pricing or product attributes. There are competitive factors. And finally, there are macroeconomic conditions that can also influence sales outcomes. We needed to examine the entire universe. This is precisely why we turn to marketing mix modeling, not only because it is the industry standard for measuring media ROI, but also because it allows you to capture the entire universe. However, as many of you know, marketing mix modeling requires continuous data, typically two, three year worth of variable in order to measure the impact of this variable factors. This is where we run into a bit of a problem a couple of years ago because Twitter had been an ad platform for only a year and a half and some of our brands continuity at Twitter looked something like this. It's not a lot of data to work with and we're a bit concerned. But we found a creative solution. Instead of measuring ROI at a brand level, we thought, well, why not pull data across multiple brands in the same category and measure category ROI for Twitter instead. Overlay multiple brands, Twitter data produces a trend that looks like this. Now we have more data to work with. Not only does it help us build more robust models, but it also allows us to measure the normative sales response to Twitter media. And I'll let Lucia talk a little bit more about the mechanics of the models. Yeah. I'll keep that short, everyone. So, yeah, market share in the business of modeling and market mix modeling is, is, is an interesting way of addressing the ROI of the Twitter in this case. So, we looked at offline marketing drivers and online marketing drivers, which is a little bit like a customer journey, as we heard a lot these days. I think, I don't know how many times we've heard it, uh, quite a lot actually. But we also looked at external factors, so competitive, macroeconomic. Uh, and then we split between direct and indirect impact. So direct impact is one of the it really drives your outcome, mostly sales. And so if, it, if a tweet drives direct sales, for example. And indirect is, for example, if a tweet drives a search on Google, which drives indirectly sales again. So this is how the mobile was built. And uh, yeah, models, models are wrong for definition. You don't know that. But some of them are usable. And to be honest, the models that we built for Twitter on category level uh, were very useful. They were uh, yeah, a picture like this shows a little bit on, on how you test them all, you, know, you test the actual uh, things that happen against uh, what the model predicts. And here we had a, a narrow of something like 6%, which means 94% of the model was right. Which is actually very strong models came out of this, uh, this exercise with Twitter. And, uh, and, and what did we learn? Well, we actually learned a lot, but today we're going to show you just a couple of highlights from our models. One of the most surprising, uh, but also intuitive findings we came across is the relationship between TV and Twitter. What we learned is that when Twitter is part of the media mix, TV dollars work harder. The ROI of TV advertising is higher. Just how much higher? Well, it really depends on the market and the category. In the UK FMCG model, TV ROI was 29% higher when Twitter was part of the media mix. In the US auto model, TV ROI was 19% higher, and in the UK movies model, 8% higher. Now, this was an important finding for us, not only because we had long believed that 
Twitter and TV work quite well together, and therefore we launched a plethora of TV-centric tools on our platform for marketers. But also, it gives marketers an important tool to elevate the return on their biggest media investment, television. But this is one of the many ways in which we analyze the relationship between TV and Twitter. And today, I can only tell you so much. However, a little bit later during the day, my colleague Alfonso Calatrava will tell you a bit more about TV and Twitter and how we work together. But I'd like to share another insight with you. We recently completed a UK movies model where we analyzed 59 box office movie launches in the UK across three years. And what we learned is that Twitter plays an extremely important role in selling box office movie tickets. In fact, the model attributed 18% of box office sales to Twitter. Now, before you guess, and some of you woke up, I can see that from here, let me tell you uh, what is actually behind this result. Well, the truth is, majority of this impact wasn't earned Twitter media, which is the conversation about movies. In fact, 13% of sales was attributed to this factor. Now, we know that this is a startling stat, but what's important to recognize is that there could be factors that we did not capture in the model, which is, for example, offline word of mouth. So therefore, we could be picking up some of the effects of offline word of mouth here as well. But it is hard to dispute that word of mouth in general is important for driving sales. It is also hard to dispute that the easiest place to track word of mouth for any brand is on Twitter. On top of that, Twitter owned media contributed another 2%. And if you're a marketer or a studio marketer, you might think, well, great, 15% between owned and earned, I don't need to do anything else. But it is important to realize that our media is outside of your control, for the most part. All media is going to be determined by the size of your audience, follower accounts. It is paid media that is the most immediate way to impact sales using Twitter. And historically, paid media contributed 2% to sales as well. On top of this, TV Twitter synergy contributed 1%. Now when you look at 2% from page, do you ask yourself, is that good? Well, it turns out that it is. It translates into £5.88 P R Y and every pound invested. And this is not the only strong result that we received from Twitter. In the recent US auto models, we received ROI of $7.90 for mass auto category and $17.80 for luxury auto category. There is a simple reason why Twitter works so well. It's a, it is a targeted platform. We use behavioral and conversational signals to connect the right audiences with the right brands. And what started for us as an exercise of measurement has become the first step into optimization, which Lucien will mention in his concluding thoughts. It's the final slide, so don't worry. So I'm just going to summarize what, what did we do. Uh, I won't ask you. What did we learn? Social is measurable. Social is very impactful. But you have to measure it in the full context and look at both direct and indirect effects. And if you start measuring now, and Peter's already said it, what gets measured gets done, and it can be very important. Thank you very much. All right. Next up is uh, Thomas Kelly. Uh, Thomas is uh, Director of Consumer Analytics and Research at AOL in the U.S. Thank you, Shu. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at ICOM 2015. Uh, let's, let's bring up the slide. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so we're shifting to, to content analytics uh, and native analytics. Uh, most of us probably agree that most people dislike online advertising. But do you ever wonder how dogs feel about it? I have. And this is their answer. Let's roll this quick video. So I do hate it, right? Humans are not the only species that hate this concept of the ad tax, where you're getting free content 
an exchange for some level of uh, ad exposure or messaging, especially in video. But I'm going to show you data today from a custom content and native uh, normative database that we built at AOL. It's one of the only ones that I know that exists, uh, where we measured over two years of uh, 50 different content programs that have run across properties on AOL, like Huffington Post, Makers, TechCrunch, and Gadget. It's a very robust database that we can understand what works and what doesn't in the world of content, custom content and native. Um, so with such a robust database, it's easy to see that obviously content works very well for brand building. But it also allows us to understand how much brand is too much when talking about content. So we broke our database out into two different groups. One where campaigns feature very light brand integration, and the other where they feature very heavy integration, very easy to do. So you would expect that for a metric like unaided recall, you're going to see a really big difference. We did, you guys, like 50 percentage points. Would we see the same thing for purchase? Yes, we ended up seeing it, a very significant uh, difference. Uh, what is that? Nine, 15 percentage points. But certainly you're leaving something on the table as far as enjoyability of that content goes if your brand is plastered all over the place, right? Not really. Three percentage points, it's not significant. So, so this concept of, of getting in people's way and giving them, giving them this load, this burden, is not really true when it comes to content when it's good. So the point here is when, it, when you're considering how much you integrate your brand in a content program, Floor it. Don't take your foot off the gas. I call this the don't be a pansy slide. But when, when you're, you're wondering, uh, how do you really know when you've gone from content that's just tolerable to something that, that you really like, that, that consumers in the audience really like, and in some cases, really love? How do you know? I'm going to show you a program now that we did for Ford called This Built America. Uh, it highlighted the Ford F-150, which is the number one selling truck in the United States. Uh, young Americans are crazy truck buyers. And the program was designed to change the attitude around the state of American manufacturing, which is very often negatively portrayed by the media, unemployment, the Rust Belt, and so on, and put a more positive spin on uh, a comeback of American manufacturing. I'm going to show you a really quick clip now, and then a very quick clip of some reaction memories we did from the audience in Atlanta, Georgia. So if we could roll that real quick. Bill, the 2015 F-150. Ford rewrote the rules of truck technology and manufacturing. The F 150 salutes Chance Rides, a company that understands being a leader often means doing what's right, not what's easy. My dad actually started in the manufacturing business right after World War II. My dad didn't here for so long. Employment was very, very long term. Morning they had a birthday party for Dwayne, who was 80 years old, and uh, he retired about 15 years ago and still comes to work every day. In our business, especially, you have to have dedicated people that really care. What do you think? I love it. Why? Because that's what I, that's what I care about. I like the way it tied everything together and showing that you know what we can do with him. Those are the kind of stories that I think, um, for to me, it actually gave me goosebumps. You know what I just bought? I bought a Mustang. You know why? Why? Made in America. So this is really American. I didn't realize how American this was until I spent a week in Spain, of course. But it's really American. But what did we see? We saw the content oozes the F-150 audience. Family, long-term employment, that dude's 80th birthday, Dwayne's 80th birthday. And the reaction shots were fascinating, right? When Charles at the end says, because that's what I care about. I mean, you can't distill an emotional connection any better than that's what I care about, especially among Southern American truckers, truck drivers. So this was really nice to see. There was one issue. The content, this built America, was preceded by a pre-roll, video pre-roll. So we wondered if we're, if we're, clearly this was a big hit content-wise. So we questioned, was the content, was this emotional goodwill going back to this pre-roll? You know, psychologically, you would think that the emotional resonance carries forward, so we decided to test that. So we bookended the content with the same exact pre-roll we just ran it as a post-roll and tested these two scenarios against each other to see, are we carrying this emotion for real forward? Is there a difference? The results were pretty interesting. For the features and benefits of the F-150, they were relatively flat. But for the emotional components, I feel Ford cares more about American industry than other uh, auto manufacturers. I feel more positively about Ford. Better impression, learn something new, more interested in the F-150. We saw significant differences between these two groups. People who saw the pre-roll and the content only versus the bookended content. So that was really kind of interesting. 
What was even more interesting and very counterintuitive in this program is that we asked them to tell us how much brand inclusion was too much. What was the right amount? And so we broke it out into three groups. Pre-roll, full, full video, pre-roll, and then a shorter uh, for content piece. And then our test group, the book edit piece. Pre-roll, full video, and the post-roll. And what we saw, 78% of that third group said the level of forward brand inclusion was just right. Do you realize what this said? We doubled their ad load, and they're seeing just right. So clearly, this is why I call this the end of the ad tax, because when our database is showing and our research is showing that when you get the content right, run it in the right context, people aren't seeing as much of an ad tax anymore. They really, these, these consumers actually thanked us. You saw that one guy say, actually gave me goosebumps, I think is what he said. They're thanking you for reminding them of who created that content. Now, uh, autos, trucks in the United States are a very emotional topic, especially when you abut it with uh, the state of American manufacturing. <coughs> this was very counterintuitive, something we never would have, would have expected, doubling an ad mode and people telling us just right, far more significantly than the other groups. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for being a great audience. Oh, 
moving in that path. Fifteen letters, the exact same number of letters as is the word cool. A coincidence? I don't think so. So the presentation we've got what we did this morning is very, very short, about seven minutes, and it, it, on average it's about 20 seconds, 27 seconds per slide. So we're going to rattle through this pretty quickly. Um, and I will be basically to pride ourselves on doing two things. We've been um, well awarded for our creativity, everyone knows us for our creativity, but in fact actually we have two pillars to our existence. We have creativity and effectiveness. And really what I want to do today is to start to lift the lid on our plan planning processes and share with you a little bit about how we derive a lot of these campaigns in the first place and how we come up with these unique and um, very compelling ideas. Okay, actually, in terms of data services, actually we support the whole business, not just over the one, but over the advertising and over the PR, with essentially these three things. Providing the insights, basically, to drive campaigns and the ideation, um, coming up with a couple of personas, the journeys, actually putting that in, into operation uh, through our delivery um, uh, parts of the company. First of all, we do the automation. We're living in a world that's very dynamic. So we don't think of these in terms of platform, uh, create uh, campaigns, we think of these in terms of platforms. It's no longer personalised communication, we think of this as personal communication. It's not push communication, but always live, live and fluid and lift and lift, as we say. It's dynamic. And it's no longer multi-channel, we think of this as omni-channel. Because in fact, actually, all of the touch, customer touch points that we're able to affect are all around us every day. So it's not just the use of of email marketing and uh, digital advertising is every single time. <coughs> All right, what I wanted to do is basically share with you five key sort of points that I think that really craft um, our thinking behind how we now embrace better and more effective uh, consumer targeting. Um, touched on this already, basically customer journeys and facing campaigns, offline to online, yeah, and effective mobile. The rise of advocacy, what we call open and close graph data, and lastly, the, the new influence of program to find. I'm going to do this by basically showing you some just actual live examples of some of the work that we're doing on. And to do that, actually, I want to share with you essentially the planning processes that we employ in order to craft uh, campaigns. We start by basically defining customer personas. Yeah. And once we basically define that audience and how they behave, their attitudes and the purchase behaviours, we then look at the customer journeys. And, and I know this is unique to Ogilvy, proximity to something very, very similar and a few many other agencies. But that fuels our ideas about the, the, what, what we're able to do within a campaign that allows us to set this out basically as to what we call the experience map. Now here's an example we've uh, recently did for a well-known company, Lab Ralph Lauren. Um, this is a, is a, uh, a program that's it's actually uh, now across Asia Pacific, uh, but it's now doing the uh, uh, work out globally. And very simply is that um, uh, we look at the broader landscape. It's not just basically as the uh, specific um, uh, consumer data. That, so we're, we're looking at basically the social landscape, the in-store experiences, and the digital footprint. Of course, we employ lots of statistics. We have many, many statisticians. We've got over 250 statisticians from memory across the world, but about 81 in the Asia Pacific. And we craft basically using things like k means cluster analysis, um, recency, frequency, and uh, monetary uh, value uh, segmentation, and uh, market basket analysis to basically define these customer personas. And for our friend, we came up with six specific personas. Um, and from these, we'll be able to focus on basically is the uh, crafting really in-depth understanding of all of these consumers. Now, this isn't just quantitative information, but it's the qualitative information that, that, that gives us the edge. It's the qualitative information that allows us to get up on the skin of the consumer and, and actually craft experiences with them in mind. And when we're doing that, when we're mapping that customer, across the customer journey, we also look at the total customer value, the total customer value delivered at each and every moment of truth. We call, we call these moments of truth, these are the inflection points throughout the customer journey where there's a messaging opportunity for us basically to, to exploit. 
And we look at that in terms of the transactional value, but also we look at that in terms of the network value. The apps that influence their, their, their collaboration uh, and their, their co-creation. Okay, um, now we're all familiar, this is a, one of my boss's favourite slides, and uh, it basically is the, the, the influence of online research to buy uh, offline and, and vice versa. And it's present in, across Asia as it is across the rest of the world these days. And um, it's another example of La Prairie. La Prairie is a very um, uh, high upmarket uh, cosmetics brand. A, a, a pot of the skin cream uh, costs up to $10,000 per pot. You can imagine somebody buying that and want to keep them very close to you. Here's the uh, similar example of their customer journey. Um, but it, it significantly, what we're able to do is start to actually understand that it's not just the digital experience that's important, but it's the in store one as well. So we're basically is to crafting and providing tools to the in-store beauty staff and uh, advisors to basically is to recognize people by their value and the things that really matter to them yeah, in, a, in a quantitative and qualitative way. So that gives you some idea of basically is that how we start to craft ideas and how we start to put those ideas into action. But let's not forget the, 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 um, the impact of social engagement. Now this is actually a study that actually I did a couple of years ago now. Um, we took a big slug of data from Melbourne Brands and looked at basically the influence <coughs> of brands engaging with consumers uh, on and offline. Um, what we found, um, quite surprisingly, um, is there was, there was a couple of things. First of all, is that um, once you, if you engage with basically these advocates, the advocates' uh, loyalty index or the loyalty score goes up by 33%. Um, that's great, but actually examples, DTAP in, in uh, uh, Thailand, who are basically doing geo-targeting, so that we know when you're going to your home, we know when to provide dynamic offers, exactly the, the price point at which you will basically take up an offer. Malaysia Airlines, one of my favourite clients right at the moment, are starting to do things like recognising your friends within the terminal, providing text messages to your loved ones when you actually touch down and on your way.